you. This is great. Just uh, s- struck me this morning that God is used to meeting people in a tent. And here we are in a tent, and uh, he's ready to meet with us in a special way. That's great. I um, hope you survived the night, all the rain. So I was coming here this morning, I thought, we're good at this. We can do this. Soggy packets of cereal in the tent and soggy clothes and people saying, I won't hug you because I'm wet and you don't care because you're wet and soggy kids and soggy everything. We can do it. We're good at it. We're British. We can do it. And uh, this is, whoops, thank you. Thank you. Um, but the most important thing is, it's, it's interesting that, you know, Duncan said, I'm going to do the fun bit. And I just want to start by saying, I'm going to do the fun bit this morning. <laughs> right. Before I do, I just want to explain that the people we saw on that little video clip were people who've been doing the School of Supernatural in Basingstoke. And it's great that you could hear their testimonies because everything I say this morning is their story. It's not just me, it's our story. We have been on a journey in Basingstoke and Emily, Mark's daughter, Emily Harlan, has been discipling us in a way I have never seen discipleship done before. She has taken a group of people who are full of doubts, full of questioning, wondering what they were going to do with their lives, and they have been totally transformed in the space of three months to being radical disciples on the edge, never having done things like this before in their lives. Some of them are my age, in their mid-60s. One, Anne, you heard speak this morning, um, was retiring from the King's School and thought, my life's over what do I do now? She didn't want to do this course. She was quite sort of grumpy about it and only did it because her husband told her to do it. And she is so full of the love of God that she is seeing amazing things happen on the streets of Basingstoke. And that is what I'm going to be sharing about this morning. So it will not be a note-taking morning at all. But I just pray in the name of Jesus that you will catch something of new life and a refreshing And something that you go out of this place this morning and you say, I will be a more radical disciple because I have met afresh with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is my prayer for you this morning. (laughs) That is the message of the effect of radical discipleship. That when stuff sucks, we can make it all right. That whatever people are going through, we have a message of hope. We have a message of deliverance because we carry the seed. We are the seed of a new breed. Jackson the puppet said so. We are the seed of a new breed. And you remember the defining moment in that little video clip was when instead of being in the world that was full of rain and full of doom and gloom, he remembered something that his father had said. And his father said, make it all right, son. Son, son, son. And he remembered who he was. We, let, we are the new, let the love shine through. And he remembered his father calling him son. And he was to go out and make a difference. Suddenly, he was a carrier of hope. That is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to you and me. I was in Morrison's recently and... Um, I was absolutely shocked at at what I saw. I think the Lord just revealed something to me. I've been praying for quite a long time now that the Lord will impart something fresh of his love for people into my heart because my heart is so limited. I don't have his love for people. I have it in measure, but his heart is bursting for people. And I knew I needed more. And I've been praying that the Lord will give me more of his heart and a little moment in Morrison's, I'm thinking, oh my word, this is your heart. I looked around and um, I saw so many people in wheelchairs and on crutches, so many of them. I saw mentally ill people with their carers. I saw harassed mothers with their children. And everywhere I looked, I saw poverty in people's faces. And I'm thinking, Lord, you want to make it all right. People are not meant to live like this. This is not what you designed it to be. You designed people for something better than this. 
And I saw just a little glimpse of the Father's heart for these people. And I looked and there were one or two people who looked as though they might have got their lives all together. They looked okay on the outside. And I thought, but how many of them have got financial crisis? How many of them are caring for a mother or father with Alzheimer's and don't know what to do? How many of them are worrying about their teenage children? How many of them have just split up from the one that they've loved? Even the ones that look all right have got a deep hunger and a deep need that only Jesus Christ can fill. Who's going to tell them? How will they ever know unless we get out there and are radical and are carrying the gospel that we so fervently believe in? And we know it. We've known it for years. We carry that gospel and there are people out there dying to hear the gospel, literally dying to hear that gospel. And I thought, Lord, what a huge mission. What a huge mission. And Jesus said it this way. He said in Luke 4:18, we're, we're so familiar with this, aren't we? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Good news to the world's troubled people. That's what the gospel was. Good news to the world's troubled people. And he sat down and in verse 22, it says this. Is not this Joseph's son? And they loved the words he spoke and they recognized an authority in his words, but they looked at the man and said, doesn't he live down the road in the carpenter's shop? The mission seemed too big and too huge and too massive to be fulfilled by the person they saw. And that is exactly the battle that you and I have in our minds, that this mission that we do actually believe in up here because Jesus said it and we're Bible-believing Christians and when he told us to go and heal the sick and set the captives free, we believe that is our commission. We don't have a problem with that, but we do have a problem when we look at who we are and we say that mission just seems too big and too majestic for me. I know me. And we see ourselves as, as Jesus might have seen himself as the carpenter's son. But though he knew he was the son of man, he also knew a different reality. He knew the secret that he was also the Messiah. He was also the son of God. When stuff sucks, make it all right, son, son, son. And I did... We had a picture early in our, in our School of Supernatural that I think might have been helpful for several of us. It was of a, a rickety, um, cobbled together channels of, of wood, like a conduit, and it looked a Heath Robinson mess of a thing. It looked unprofessional and unable to do anything, but down it flowed the pure water. And you and I need to take our eyes off the rickety things that we are and say, that's not the issue. The issue is the pure water. And as long as we look at the, at the rickety conduit, we will never, ever feel prepared to carry the pure water. But it's not about the vessel. It's not about the earthen pots that, that we read about in Corinthians. It's not about that. In fact... The fact that it's so rickety actually demonstrates the fact that it's the power of God that is there. It's not about us. And we focus on the wrong things so often, don't we? Well, you've seen here some of these people of how they were before the School of Supernatural. And how we are now is completely different. Quite a lot of us have got the Emily Harland grin. That was one thing we inherited. If you see Emily, those of you who know her, she's got a huge, great grin because she's so full of the joy of the Lord. And some of us now, when we see one another, we, we just have this big grin on our faces and we want to share stories about what's been happening. There's a new joy that has come to us. And we're confident in who we are because we know that we can't make anything right in our own strength. We can only do it as we operate as sons and daughters of the living God. And we're finding a new identity in that. 
This joy, Hazel mentioned it this morning, it, it's interesting. In, in Luke 10, when the disciples came back after they'd, they'd been sent out, when the 70 or 72 came back, in, in Luke 10, verse 17, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan falling like lightning of heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. We are not going out looking for experiences of God. We are not look, going out looking for healings and miracles. We are looking for the love of God to invade people's lives and signs and wonders will follow. They are not leading, they are following as we share the love of God. So we're not getting sidetracked into something weird here because the central focus always has to be the Lord Jesus Christ and our worship of him. But... How many of us long for that word that we know so well to see it in our day, to see it in your life, that signs and wonders will follow. We are just beginning to see this happen in our lives and in the streets of Basingstoke. And just before we leave this, I love this in verse 21. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Jesus himself rejoiced when they came back and they were full of joy because they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. It rejoiced his heart. And he rejoiced in the fact that his father decided in his wisdom to use little children to fulfill his mission and commissioned them to fulfill the mission. That's you and I. And then we are told that you are children now. It's, it, it's so exciting and it's so fun. And we can't do this except by knowing him more. We can't get this from books. You cannot get this from a book. You cannot get it from my life. You have to go on your journey and experience the love of God in a greater way in your lives. Out of that, out of the overflow, you will then see amazing things happen in the lives of other people. So I just want to go through one or two um, characteristics of, of uh, what, what I feel are uh, radical disciples. Uh, just to make sure we're on the same page here, I wonder what you think of when you think of a radical disciple. I think the first thing I think of is passion. A love for Christ. They are so passionate. A radical disciple is passionate. They have an intimacy with Jesus. After all, the disciples lived with him 24-7. They were intimate with him. We need to have a greater and growing intimacy with Jesus Christ because it all flows from there. Christ being central, Christ being at the heart. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The, the love that we have for Jesus is not an add-on. It's not about a Sunday morning or a midweek meeting. It's not about that. It's about something burning within us that is a desire that is like a fire in our souls and that we love the Lord our God with everything we have. No half measures, no half measures a full passion and intimacy with Jesus Christ. I, this is what we're discovering. It's not been a method to go out and pray this way with somebody on the street, although we have learned some do's and don'ts along the way, but it's not about that. It's burning with the passion of Jesus Christ and saying, God, you are everything to me. There is no one else. You are everything. Use me. I want to be used by you. I want to give you my life afresh. I want to be poured out for you. I will not live an ordinary life anymore. It's not so much fun. It's much more fun to live a radical life. We think we're saving our lives if we try and compromise and live at half measure. No. Freedom is in total surrender. 
that's our freedom. And a radical disciple is totally committed to God. Confident, not in themselves, but in the gospel and the word of God. I am glad I don't have to put my confidence in my own understanding. There are so many things I don't understand. I have so many questions. And you know, they don't have to bother me. <laughs> they don't have to bother me. I've not given up asking God about them. I've not thrown my, my brain away. But I, don't, I am not formed by my own understanding. I'm formed by the word of God and what he says. That is the greater reality. I am not living in the fullness of the reality of God. I am on the way. And I love his reality, who he says we are, what he says we are to do, and that he will be with us. He will not leave us. He is right there. So exciting. So much fun. Confident, not in ourselves, but in the gospel. I see radical disciples moving in signs and wonders in the church and on the street, seeing people saved in our cities, cities being transformed, nations being discipled, and that this is all part of our normal Christian life. So we'll see how many of these we can get through. There are about five, I think, but we'll see where we go. So what are the characteristics of a radical disciple? First of all, they experience encounters with God. Encounter leads to engagement. If you encounter God in a, in, a, in a real way, it will change something within you and you will engage in a new way, both with him and with others. I don't know how many of you came to Jesus in the first place. Those of you who perhaps did have an encounter. I was, I'm very thankful that I did have an encounter with God. Um, my encounter was that I thought I was leading a good life. My life was pretty together. I didn't do anything majorly wrong. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, didn't, never saw drugs in my life. I was, you know, sorted. And in that moment when Jesus apprehended me, I became so, had such a sense of uncleanness and I knew that all my righteousness was like filthy rags before a holy God. And in that moment, I just felt filthy. Do you know that was so good because God saw me as I was. And then within seconds, it was like a liquid love flowing over me. That was my encounter with God, my first encounter with God. And I became a radical disciple. This is going back to the 70s. Some of you know our story. We sold, every, we sold our house. We lived communally. We had nothing. We wanted to give everything up. We were foolish enough to pick up the Acts of the Apostles and said, oh, it says do this, let's do it. Oh, it says live this way, let's do it. We were crazy. They were the most exciting times. They're the most fulfilling, real times. Radical discipleship, an encounter with God, moving us to a place where we say, I'll do anything for you. And enjoying the fruit of that. This is what we were made for. And the great, the great men and women in the Bible, they had encounters with God when they had a great mission. And I don't need to remind you of them. People like Gideon, the things that he had to do, he needed an encounter with God. Moses, what a phenomenal encounter with God he had. But it enabled him from going to saying, I can't do this, to being the man who actually faced the demonic power of his day and, set the, and to lead a people out of captivity. That great encounter enabled him to fulfill his mission. Quite a few years ago now, um, Tom Bedford, who is one of the American prophets that we spend time with, he made this statement and it's changed my personal life with Jesus. He said, you have a right to expect encounters with God. And it set me on a course of expecting encounters with God. It set me on a course of saying, 
I will make in my life, as we heard as Gaynor shared at the beginning, I will make a place in my, my life where I come on my face before you. I don't just want to stand before you, Lord. I want to metaphorically and physically, I want to come on my face before the throne of God. I don't want God to be some sort of um, locked away person, uh, historical and, and yes, it's wonderful what, what, what happened. And I don't just want to be that. I want to see him breaking into my life and into the life of those around me. I want to see him breaking into the church. I want to see him breaking into the streets of our towns and our cities. And it starts with us having a deep encounter with God so that we've got something to carry into those places. Otherwise, we'll do stuff without the power. Don't want to live that way. Can't do it. It's about intimacy with God. And in the intimacy, he will meet with us because he's promised to. You can have encounters with God. Deepening and consistent encounters with God. The disciples around Jesus encountered Jesus 24-7 every day. They were encountering the Son of God 24-7. That's why they could be so radical, I guess. Fred Drummond is the director of EA Scotland. He says, when we offer engagement without encounter, we have reduced ourselves to religious secularists devoid of kingdom power. It comes from face-to-face -face time in the presence of God that we open ourselves and receive his power in order to live. And this goes into the second thing, that out of encounters, number two, live, uh, live power-filled lives by the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we can do it. It's the difference between the, acts, the, the disciples in Acts before Pentecost and after Pentecost. Just look at them. Which, which would describe us? Which would describe you in your life? If you were to assess yourself, where would you put yourself on the scale in this picture of the disciples in the upper room waiting for the Spirit? And together and probably wondering what's going on and not having much of a clue as to what was going on here, remembering, did he say this, did he say that? And then they're zapped with the power of the Holy Spirit and they come out and the very city that had crucified Jesus were now saying, what must we do to be saved? What made the difference? The fact that those same disciples were now full of the power of the Spirit. That's what gave them their boldness. Are you fearful? I guess most of people in this tent would say, I am a bit, I am a bit nervous. It scares me silly to the thought of going out on the streets and talking to people about Jesus. I'll just have you know that darling Emily, dear Emily, so sweet, the homework she gave us relentlessly was every week, go out every day, tell someone about Jesus. She has no mercy, that girl. She looks sweet. Believe me, she isn't. There's something behind that lovely, sweet smile. She was intent on discipling us. She would not let us go. And we were fearful. We were, fe not of Emily, but, you know. well, we were a bit scared of Emily as well, to be completely honest. Scary Mary. But you know, We've learned to go in boldness because of the Holy Spirit within us. You cannot do it if you do not have an ongoing infilling of the Holy Spirit. We're crazy if we try and do it another way. If they hadn't had that, the disciples would have had two options. Jesus ordered them to go and wait. And if they hadn't, receive the Spirit, they'd have built a memorial around a name. They would have become a movement of nostalgia built upon memories. That probably describes some denominations today. A movement of nostalgia built upon memories. Or they could have gone out and said, oh, he said we need to heal the sick and... and uh, preach the gospel, let's go out and do it. He told, we, we saw how he did it, let's go out and do it. And they would have done it in their own strength. 
We don't have that story as we read Acts. We have a different version. The version is power, Holy Spirit-filled, powerful, men and women going out and making a difference and turning the world upside down. I like that version. I don't know about you. Don't let's be satisfied with powerless lives. If your life is powerful, go to God about it and say, I'm not satisfied living this way. I am made for more than this. Thirdly, radical disciples are mobile and active. We are educated a lot more than we're activated. I wish I'd got a fiver for every page of notes I'd taken in Christian meetings. I am an avid note taker and I have got books and books and journals of notes. Of course, never look at them, but I have taken them and they're all there. But if I compare that with going out and preaching the gospel and healing the sick and doing all the things that, that, that God has told us to do in his word. I have a very big pile of notes. I am very well educated and I have very little experience. But most of that experience has been in the last few months and I'm on a journey. And at my age, if I can start again with a refreshing and say, no, I want to live life a different way, then there is hope for every single person in this tent this morning. Why not? Just want to tell you the, how, how it started. Um, as I said, I'll tell you a few stories. Um, I won't tell you a few stories. I'll tell you one story. <laughs> Time's running out. The very first time I went out on the streets, I like systems. I like, I like um, being told clearly. Of course, the Holy Spirit doesn't like working that way. And I, I like the Holy Spirit to say this and go and do it. And... Um, I like this thing of treasure seekers where you can pray before you go out on the streets and say, Holy Spirit, will you show me who I'm going to speak to? I like that because the safety box there, you see that person, you go up and you think, well, God's already spoken. So before I went out onto the streets, the very first time I was trying to work out a system. And um, anyway, the Lord, I, I thought the Lord isn't going to show me anything full of doubt. The Lord isn't going to show me anything. I remember thinking that. And I immediately saw a bright yellow scarf. And I thought, oh, oh, that's interesting. So go down the street, shared it with the person I was with and said, the Lord's shown me a bright yellow scarf. That's stupid. Who is going to wear a plain bright yellow scarf? And so we went down the street, met a Christian, wonderful. Can I pray with you? in my comfort zone. Yes, she said. I thought, well, I can go back and say I've prayed with somebody. She, <laughs> scared of Emily, scary. Anyway, she, I said, we're supposed to be praying with people, but you're here, you need prayer, this is wonderful. So I prayed with her. As I'm praying with her, this young woman goes by, all in black, pushing a little, a little child with a bright yellow scarf. And I'm going, you know, but she's walking out of town. So I was continue praying with the Christian. The Christian lady says, ooh, the so-and-so in Marks and Spencers, I expect she'd like prayer, another Christian. Go down to Marks and Spencers, this is great. Thank you, God, you are amazing. Christians to pray with, yes. This isn't what we were meant to be doing at all, by the way. Go down there, we're walking back, and the lady I'm with says, isn't that your yellow scarf again? This same woman is now marching back at a great rate of knots. I thought, I'll have to run to keep up with her. So instead of going back to where, where we were, um, I said, I'm gonna, we're going to follow her. Let's follow her. She goes into, I have now become, um, what do you call them? Where you, stalker. I said, Margaret, we could get arrested for this. You realize... Like we are now stalking people in the town. This is very worrying. So she goes into Devon and I said, I'm not praying in a shop. This is just ridiculous. This is first day, I'm not praying in a shop. She said, well, it depends where she stops. I'm thinking, oh, well, tea and me. So she stops to look at some jewelry and um, Margaret is so sweet. So I'm really marching up. She's, this woman in the white, yellow scarf stops and I go, You know, I was full of faith and power till that woman stopped. And I thought, I can't do this. So I walk away and Margaret very sweetly says, 
excuse me, I'm a Christian. I'm thinking, oh. This is not me. No, I can't do it. I can't do this. And uh, she said, and we're out and we're just praying and we wondered if you'd like prayer. I'm thinking, oh, cringe, cringe. I can't. And um, she looks around and she says, oh, I'm a Christian too. So I march up there. <laughs> Get out the way. This is my yellow scarf. So elbow Margaret out the way. Sweet Margaret gets elbowed out the way. And this woman is from Eastern Europe, Europe and I forget which country she's from, but she said, my mother's desperately ill. She said, would you pray? And I think she was probably Catholic. So I said, yes. And she thought I'd go home and pray. Uh, no, no. Oh, no. This is my yellow scarf. I tell you, this is fun. This is the fun bit. This is the fun bit, not the inflatables. This is the fun bit. I've got the fun bit. Uh, we heard, um, we had a, 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 a Facebook message from one of the guys out in North Carolina called Eddie. And he was in Walmart last week. And as he was in Walmart, there were three young guys, about 14 and 15, who were hovering around they were going to buy condoms. And um, so they were hovering around and this other guy comes up and sort of nudges Eddie and says, oh, look at those knuckleheads. And Eddie looked at them. He didn't see knuckleheads. He saw three young lads that were ripe to meet Jesus. And so he led them all to the Lord, <laughs> as you would when they're buying condoms and 14 and 15. Little did they know, Eddie says, little did they know that they would have a God moment that day in Walmart. And those young guys have promised, they've committed themselves to seek God diligently. Isn't that amazing? An encounter in Walmart. Two or three days later, he's going to um, KFC or he's passing by KFC. And there's a, a homeless guy there who is clearly demonized. And Eddie just goes up to him and says, do you want to get rid of that thing? He says, yes. So he delivers him on the street, takes him in and buys him a meal. That's a good story, isn't it? Hey. Listen, isn't this what we're meant to be seeing as normal Christianity? Isn't this what the book tells us to do? Isn't this what you and I as mature Christians should be seeing? We should all have stories like this. And I'll tell you, I want to make you jealous because everyone who's been on that supernatural school, they've all got stories like this. It may not be quite as dramatic as that, but they are encountering people on the street and they're seeing people uh, receive the love of Christ. Just want to say, don't ever wait until you're not scared. You'll never move. Being scared is fine. <laughs> don't worry about it. Just don't let it define what you do. Don't let it rule you. It's there if you're scared, fine. But go and do it. And you will find that your confidence will grow. See, Jesus had a serious word to say to the scribes and Pharisees. He said, they preach, but they don't practice. I don't want him to be, set, be able to say that about me. I want to be able to practice what I know to be the gospel because my confidence is in the gospel. We want to live on the offensive, not the defensive. You know, things are changing in the streets of Basingstoke. We, we long for our, our towns and cities to change. Can I just, this is just, this is just me, just weigh this. But you know, a lot of us have been involved in missional communities over these last years. And we've done that because we felt God tell us to do that, haven't we? That we need, yeah? This is, this is the way we found God directing a lot of us that we do mission or community. In other words, that you don't just spend 24 seven with Christians, but that you get out there, you do something that you are interested in or that you enjoy doing and that you meet people there and you hopefully look for opportunities to share the gospel with them. Do you know, I think that's been a setup. I think God set up channels. 
I think many of us got Phil down there in his running club. You know, he's, he's in his running club for two reasons. Yes, to get fit and to have a break and to enjoy doing what he loves doing. But he's believing for people in that running club to come to Christ. He's not in there preaching all the time. He's in there available all the time and full of the power of God. And I think these missional communities that we've set up, take Basingstoke, for example, that's the one I know. We've got um, street pastors. We've got Cafe Vivo, where people can go. We've got Friday night worship with open doors and live music in where the, where the clubs are. And uh, we've got English cafes. We've got all sorts of stuff. The danger of me mentioning these is that I'll miss out a lot. They are set up chaplaincies in the town. And we've got people praying for revival in the church because they feel that's what God should, that's, that's what God is calling them to do. We have channels set up ready for revival in Basingstoke. I believe it's going to happen. And we're beginning to see things happen in a small measure on the streets. Let me tell you the kind of things. David Lamborn, you saw on the video there. He doesn't have a car, so he's at bus stops quite a lot. And his little mission field is at bus stops. And he's been going up to people at bus stops and saying, can I pray for you? A very interesting thing happened recently. He was standing at a bus stop. He didn't say anything to the lady who was standing there. He didn't say he was a Christian or say, can I pray for you, which was his normal little spiel. He didn't say anything. She goes up to him and says, will you pray for me? I like that. Reminds me of Isaiah 2. That wonderful, wonderful picture of people streaming up to the house of the Lord and say, show us your ways. We can see you have God. Show us your ways. It's beginning in our streets. Will you pray for me? Robin, who's also here, also he helped organize, well, he did organize the school, Supernatural. He is on, with healing on the streets. They're just packing up, ready to go home. A young man comes up to him and says, excuse me, are you a Christian? Yes, yes, we are. Would you pray for me? I'm a Muslim. There's a lot of anger in my family. My father is a very angry man. Would you pray for me? A Muslim coming up to a Christian and asking for prayer. I like it. Tony. Tony won't mind me saying, he's, he's, he's quite a, a quiet sort of guy. He's um, very bold in the spirit, but very quiet by nature. And he's by, on our, in our hospital grounds and he starts to hear, um, he starts to hear uh, uh, somebody crying out and he thinks somebody's being raped. And he goes up and there's a group of youths and he says to them, oh, has anybody heard about Jesus Christ? And some, uh, some of them say, Yes, and some of them are very rude. And he thinks, right, keep going. Um, does anybody need healing? Yes, this girl says, I've got a really bad back. So Tony prays for this back. She says, oh, it's better. This is a group of youth, you know, messing around. So he thinks, right, I'll go, I'll go while I'm winning. So he sh shouts out his phone number and then goes. A week or so later, a group of young people in the town come up. This girl's saying to the, to the rest of the young people, there's Tony, there's Tony, come, he'll tell you about Jesus. He'll pray for you. So now you've got an unsaved youth who's been healed, who is bringing other youth to a very timid guy who is just full of the power of God on the streets. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Three more stories, and I'm gone the red now. I'm minus. Right, I must just tell you this one. Um, our big issue, Salah, has come to the Lord. Yeah, that's a good one. And there's one more story. Stop it. The clock, stop. A woman called Vicky, I can tell this story because she's, she's got it out there in a blog. She's been um, satanic rich, satanically ritual abused as a child, horrendous injuries, horrendous life. And she, one of her illnesses being her lungs fold over and she gets infection in her lungs. It's got a very 
posh name some of you may know. She was told the last time she was in, in intensive care that she would not survive another bout of this in intensive care. She not only gets through intensive care, that she is totally and completely healed. And on her records in Basingstoke Hospital, it says, minor miracle. Yes. That's because fearful, frightened, inadequate men and women, full of doubts, a tiny little group, 12 people. It's not just those people. There are other people obviously out there doing it and praying. It. But these people are consistently going out on the streets with the power of God saying, I will be radical. I will no longer lead a powerless life. I am tired of leading a, a, a normal life uh, that I see it. I will lead the normal Christian life and I will see my town change and come into line with what I believe Christ wants to do within our nation. Do you want to live that kind of life? Can the musicians come up? Do you want to live that, that kind of life? I can't hear an amen. Do you want to live that? Listen, it's no fun the other way. It's no fun doing it in your own strength. It's limited. This is what you were made for. Do you know you are wired for breakthrough? That's why they came back, the 72 came back with joy because they had seen breakthrough. They were rejoicing because something within them was saying, this is what I was made for. This is what I was created for. And you are wired for breakthrough. That's why testimony raises joy in your heart. You're meant for breakthrough. You're built for breakthrough. You were created for breakthrough. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That the kingdom of heaven is waiting to invade earth. And he's doing it through you, ordinary men and women on fire with the love and the passion of Jesus Christ. Yes. And it all starts with yielding to him. There's one thing it takes. Everything. Just one thing, everything. 